East Africa today. Charles Kabuchi from Nairobi has joined us. He's one of our key staff people uh, based in East Africa, and he will have a lot of insights for you that will be very practically oriented toward your action as uh, strategic exporters. So we're looking forward to an exciting hour. East Africa is the fastest growing market in the world right now economically, and there's a lot of opportunity there for American exporters. So we're glad that you could join us. And I'm sorry for those who haven't joined us because it is a need to know market. It really is one market that has uh, key aspects that make it a uh, a fast moving market not only that but uh, one that's very accessible for american exporters so uh maybe charles if you could just introduce yourself a little bit and uh then we can start rolling the conversation here good morning you're, you're muted uh, yeah. uh, how you all doing my name is charles kibuch as you had part of the team at zurcom i've been with zurcom for about six years, based here in East Africa. And Nairobi is the capital of, of Kenya where I live and reside. So I have extensive experience with uh, market entry, uh, market research, market study, B2B introduction with, in various sectors uh, in the region. Also double also the work for South Africa, for Tanzania, for Uganda, um, basically throughout Africa. And I'm glad to be here. Yeah, Richard, over to you. Great, thank you very much. And and just so you know, and I see some of our uh, friends who are involved in this project, we uh, Charles is also heading up for all of Africa, the WUSATA market research project that involves uh, 25 companies looking for uh, markets across the uh, the different parts of Africa. So uh, we're we're looking forward to that and we are keenly uh, tied into other staff across Africa who are uh, working on your uh, your work projects there. So I'm going to start sharing the um, the presentation and uh, making sure that we're all together with things here. So um, Charles, can you see this? Very good. Okay. So East Africa, let's get on the on the move here as soon as my my clicker starts responding uh again an important map of africa this is where our staff are located and you'll see that we do have a very good positioning we're also located in morocco now and we are um uh, a team with a vast amount of experience based over 26 years of working in africa to help uh, companies particularly american companies coming in uh, and we are um, very, uh, very excited to be talking to you today about uh, how you can experience uh, getting into the African market or uh, experiencing getting into new uh, regions of Africa because Africa is a big place. It's a place with a, um, uh, you can actually fit almost four continental USAs into the continent of Africa. That's how big it is. So the region that we're talking about is uh, about three quarters the size of the United States. Uh, and so we're, um, we, we've are we got a very, uh, a fair amount of information to convey to you, but we're gonna try to uh, bring it down to some uh, points that are particularly important for exporters. This is a slide that I always like to put into almost every presentation back in 1950. Um, Africa had maybe 5% of the world's population. About now, it's about 18%. By the end of this century, it will be over 40% of the world's population as we see Africa uh, increase as the rest of the world is declining in population. And so we're seeing major population almost crashes in places like Europe, uh, the Far East, including China, Korea, Japan. Um, and within the food and beverage sector, it's important to understand, of course, that uh, that mouths to feed, the number of people out there mean markets. And if those people have money to pay for those products, then that's that's what makes a a good market. And Africa is strategically positioned to be uh, the entry market right now 
as we're seeing things develop. So very quickly, if we look at the top 20 growing economies in the world, 12 of them are in Africa, excuse me, and five are in East Africa. So East Africa has a preponderant share of the uh, the growth in in the market, in the global markets. And I just like to to share that even within Africa, we're looking at very fast growth. Uh, Charles, take it over for a second. You're muted. Can you? Okay, I think I've I, I okay think now? I've uh, recovered. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that, everybody. Yeah, sorry, sorry about uh, that. Yeah, so so even within Africa, which has a very average fast growth of um, uh, growth, we we have East Africa coming out on top. And so we're expecting that East Africa will be uh, growing at rates that will approach about 5.8% over the coming year. And this will likely increase in 2025, 2026. So uh, Kenya is uh, one of the countries there. We call it a, I would call it a leading uh, stepping stone into the market. And Nairobi is the urban center distribution hub for uh, for Kenya and East Africa in many cases. And so it's important that Charles has a, a lot of things to say about the market and we'll be uh, we will be bouncing off of each other as as we go through the presentation. But uh, importantly, Africa, with a population of over one point four billion, is now the largest regional market in the world with its growth in population. Uh, well, China is shrinking. India has stopped growing actually in population. Africa is going to continue to grow for many decades. And so we're looking at a demographic shift in the world that was illustrated in that first slide. And East Africa is central to this. East African populations are growing. But if we look back to the uh, the graphs that we indicated, the, the population uh, growth aspect accounts for about 2.2%. Uh, 5% or so of that growth. The rest of that 3.5% or so is based on the uh, the real growth in the economy. So we're seeing that the average person is getting wealthier. And if you're watching uh, cities like uh, Nairobi and Kampala and Dar es Salaam and even a lot of the minor cities, you're seeing a lot of very fast change in terms of new highways, uh, railroads, um, uh, luxury places to eat, hotels, uh, infrastructure buildings, a lot of um, important things that we're seeing. And tied to this is a bigger demand for um, for grocery uh, sales, for um, food services, for online delivery. And we're going to be discussing a bit of that using Kenya as a country example for for the region. So just importantly to, to look at what's happening in Africa, we have um, uh, four countries that we profiled here in East Africa with their demographics. And these demographics in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Rwanda are very illustrative of what's happening in Africa with uh, Uganda, a medium age of 16.7. If you can imagine that the average age in a country is 16, uh, not even voting age. Um, it, it, this is important to understand. And, and all the rest of them, they are under 20. So maybe um, maybe just a quick comment about um, what, the, uh, what the word on the street is about uh, the young population there. Uh, Charles? You have to unmute. Sorry about that. You'd think after COVID, <laughs> we'd get a handle of this. Yeah. So you, uh, 
youth driven demographics in Kenya, as you've mentioned, about 75 percent are under the age of 35. This makes it one of the most youthful populations in Africa. Um, with over 1 million young people entering the job market annually, Kenya, Kenya's youth are a significant driver of economic activity and innovation in the, in the country. Kenya's youth are highly engaged with technology, as, as, as you know, uh, we've, um, we've been keen to uh, join in trends on TikTok and Instagram. Um, and they're using these social platforms also to uh, run businesses. Uh, the youth are increasingly urbanized with more moving to cities in Nairobi and in Mombasa for education and employment. Approximately about 40% of the population resides in urban areas. Yeah, so despite that, yes, we do have challenges uh, with unemployment, with the uh, rates hovering around uh, 30%. Uh, the gap has encouraged many young people to pursue entrepreneurship. Yeah. Very um, good. Yeah. Uh, so thanks, Charles. So we, we see that this is in in um in in juxtaposition to what is happening in europe for example in china where populations are decreasing america is not decreasing in population but it is getting older right now so there's things that are happening in terms of the um the, the general population uh growth around the world uh there's a reason why uh actually during the last couple of years, and surprisingly so, the number of Americans going to Mexico has outstripped the number of Mexicans going to the United States. That's a, a part of the growth of um, wages in Mexico and, and the quality of living. Uh, but where we're seeing uh, people coming across the border, the southern border from the United States, they're not coming from Mexico, they're coming from Central America. And so demographic trends typically indicate that we're likely to see that for another 10 years. Um, and so we're we're looking at that uh, influx and we're seeing that while America is changing in some aspects, Africa is as well. And we are uh, experiencing a very youthful um, entrepreneurial renaissance here, which is uh, surprising to a lot of people. And we'll get a lot into that later. By the year 2030 or so, Africa will be producing uh, a lot of the world's workforce. In fact, there will be more people coming from Africa entering the workforce than there will be from any other region. By the end of the century, there will be more people coming into the workforce from Africa than all of the rest of the world combined. So keep in mind, obviously, that AI is going to be affecting what, how do we even define the workforce um, and, and a lot of th these kind of things. But the world is shifting very quickly and we have to move with it as exporting uh, companies. We have to understand what, what is happening in the trends and we've got to be on top of where our markets are moving. So these are the kinds of things that you have to watch for. And interesting trends that we also see in terms of labor are that uh, we're we're facing a whole new wave of how to define labor there's a lot of companies popping up around africa now supplying uh, digital labor uh, meaning people working remotely uh, to companies based in europe the united states even asia and so people don't move geographically for jobs anymore. They can work remotely. And COVID did teach us some of these things during the lockdown. And so there are uh, whole recruitment agencies based on building new, um, new, new jobs for young people in Africa where they weren't able to previously take a hold of a job uh, in the local environment, but something exists and companies are able to, to use them in uh in work and typically this is starting with professional level people at, at doing finance accounting uh consulting uh call centers are also becoming a big item right now uh companies that do marketing are taking uh african young people and uh you know 
bringing them into their companies on a remote level. So it, it has nothing to do with bringing people into the United States or the United Kingdom or Australia, but it has a lot to do with bringing them into your uh, the company workforce. And there are companies on the African side that work as labor brokers and are developing this. So this is a huge new wave of what's happening. And so we're seeing a lot of the, uh, the pent up demand on both sides where we have a, effectively a, uh, a labor shortage of young people in a lot of the world and a surplus of young people who are qualified, educated and ready to take on work um, a- able to do that. So there, there's really interesting things happening where we're watching this. But what all this is meaning is that the uh, the capabilities are matching where the the money is being spent and young people are earning money at a faster growth rate and uh, able to take advantage of global opportunities, not least in finding jobs, but also in creating their own. And so we have a very entrepreneurial market. Uh, The East African community has almost 400 million people in it. Uh, the, The country of the Democratic Republic of Congo recently joined, and I believe that Somalia is now a, an associate member. Charles, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Still in the process of getting its membership. Yeah, that's right. So, so the uh, EAC is the is like the cornerstone of the economy there. They have a lot of common protocols, which uh, create it as a uh, a common market. It's one of the uh, the first originating common markets in Africa that has been. Uh, the most successful since the 1960s when uh, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda joined together um, after independence from Britain. And there was a uh, a big movement to bring a lot of the the common elements together. Uh, These countries typically all have a very strong uh, affiliation together in, in culture and language uh, because the languages of uh, English uh, were h- historically important, but more importantly, Swahili is the common language of these countries and Eastern Congo. So there is a, a an important aspect to that. And so we've seen the uh, the markets grow together as their contemporary cultures have brought them together in a, um, in a partnership. So I, I would assume that uh, with the language Swahili, uh, I don't know that they speak it so much in in Somalia, but maybe Charles, if you could just comment on some of the cultural commonalities that you would find in the EAC. Yeah, so in the EAC, um, as Richard has stated, as you can see, we have Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, South Sudan, Uganda, and Tanzania. So Tanzania, Kenya, and DRC, especially to the East of DRC, we find many people who speak Swahili. You'd find that early year education for most of the children would be speaking in Kiswahili. Uganda, predominantly English. Swahili is, uh, I'd say, like the second, third language. South Sudan, one of the newer members of East African community, also got its independence. It's one of the youngest nations, actually, in the world, in Africa. Uh, ha, uh, high potential there. They have a high amount of crude oil that they're exporting through the country. There's a lap set. Uh, we call it a lap set. There's a railway running from the coast of uh, Kenya all the way to the south of South Sudan. Uh, they hope to export some of their produce and some of their crude oil. Uh, hope They're also working on a pipeline on that direction. Actually, also they speak um, they speak Kiswahili. Uh, I could also add that uh, Kenya, Uganda uh, were colonized by the British, hence the English um, uh, background, English heritage. Tanzania was a German protectorate, then later moved to the British. Also, um, English is one of the predominant languages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thanks very much. Um, And what is really interesting about this region is that some of the largest recent finds of petroleum uh, exist now in Uganda and uh, in 
and South Sudan. Also, in terms of gold, it's possible that Uganda is sitting on a uh, a couple trillion dollars worth of gold reserves that have not yet been touched. Nobody even knows what is available in the Congo. The Congo has uh, not been a market that has been accessible generally to world markets overall. And so as that country stabilizes, there's lots of potential. You get, uh, Tanzania is already one of the world's largest gold markets. Uh, Kenya yeah. is exemplary in its horticulture and its agriculture. Um, and so we're seeing that this region is a uh, not not only a potential um, market, not just in agriculture and, and all kinds of things, but but it's also moving ahead in digital fields. Um, maybe uh, what what's happening in Nairobi relative to uh, the digital jobs and uh, the, what they're calling the new African Silicon Valley over there, Charles? I didn't get that. Sorry, you broke off, Richard. Uh, Nairobi is is effectively almost like the African Silicon Valley. There's a lot going on with a lot of new companies positioning themselves there. Uh, Kenya is is a uh, a really um, interesting market for uh, for young people getting into the IT sector. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So with um with the, how the economy is going with the Silicon Savannah, we are getting many young people uh, learning how to code and uh, 50 percent of the startups in uh, Kenya are run by young people under the age of 35. Um, some of them are going into e-commerce space, some are going into uh, the tech space, selling software, selling uh, services um, to their western countries. Mm -hmm. So we can see that there's a whole big range of um, of markets and the availability of young people starting to fill these markets. And just to point out too that we're not talking about a small region. This region that we're looking at is as big as Western Europe. And you can see that if you were to stretch um, you know, the, the size of these countries, you, you could reach from Lisbon to almost Moscow and uh, from Stockholm down to uh, to Tunis. And th so the, the region is is quite large and it's something that uh, a lot of Americans don't really grasp until they start traveling and start getting um, flights across Africa, that it is a big place and that the, the Mercador uh, project projections on the map don't really do it justice. So we're uh, we're look looking at a very large uh, geography that includes a lot of ethnicities, a lot of diversity across economies, and a lot of uh, economic growth as this part of the world starts to uh, connect with the rest of the world. And I do have to say that um, the, even though uh, the EAC is important, what is really driving a lot of African uh, interest right now is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is bringing the whole continent into one common market. And as the protocols develop, uh, we saw that the, uh, the the common market was established in 2021. It was formalized and almost everybody, all countries have uh, ratified it except for Sudan and Libya, I believe right now. Uh, so we've got a very strong potential to bring a model to Africa, which is similar to what the European Union is right now in Europe, although without a lot of the uh, a lot of the politics. So it's going to be much more uh, simply an economic tie together. But it, it is the largest common market in the world in terms of numbers of countries, in terms of population and in terms of the size of the geography. So we have an important aspect of what is uh, happening in the world here right in front of you. And as you understand how to get into one part of Africa, within 10 or 12 years, you should be able to understand how to get into other parts as the protocols start to uh, co-evolve and, and, and come together. And particularly in things like for, for food exports, uh, phytosanitary requirements, uh, labeling requirements, um, uh, patent requirements and all of these sorts of things. The, these are all being 
developed in cooperation and uh, it will take many years of negotiation just as it did with Europe. Um, there are discussions in the long future about maybe having a common currency. Um, I, I don't think that that's practical at the present moment, but we're we're seeing aspects of Africa coming together as a common market in its entirety. And this will affect American exporters because it will make it an easier market to understand analytically. It doesn't mean that Africa is forming into one political location, but it does mean that through understanding how to enter uh, one market, there's going to be a lot of commonalities because the uh, the exterior and interior movement requirements for goods and services is going to be um, more uh, br brought into alignment. So this is something that as an American exporter, you really have to be aware of. Um, I'm going to let Charles maybe just discuss uh, the through the next three slides and uh, talk about the growth of formalized grocery shopping, online delivery, and the food services sector. So Charles, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Richard. So uh, growth of the formalized grocery shopping. So we've seen an grocery retail sales in Kenya grew by 11% in 2020 reaching about $8.5 billion. The sector is projected to grow to about 10% on compound annual growth rate between 2022 and 2027. So there's a case study, I don't, uh, some of you may know of Carrefour, it's a, it's a, um, it's a French uh, retailer. They opened, they came into Kenya in the market in 2016. Um, and has grown from six stores in 2018 to 19 stores by 2023. It holds 8% market share in the retail sector. So Carrefour's strategy of opening stores in prime urban locations such as malls appeals to the urban middle class. As a result, small, the occupancy rate has increased to about 2.1% to 7.9% in 2023. So this has boosted um, retail yield uh, in the um, in the Nairobi metro metropolitan area. Also, we have seen a, an expansion and a growth uh, of American fast food um, uh, chains. So, just sorry, I've just skipped ahead. Just as KFC, we've seen Subway, we've seen Domino's Pizza, we've seen Cold Stone Creamery. They have established a presence in Kenya. Papa John's. Um, Famous Papa Jones in the US, they've opened their first restaurant in Nairobi, and they plan to open 30 more outlets by the December of 2024. That's next year. Yeah. Um, hotels, we've seen the uh, Best Western, we've seen Kempinski, there's Marriott, there's Crown Plaza, have expanded uh, in Kenya du due to Nairobi's role as a business hub. So we're having many conferences, we're having a lot of tourists uh, coming into the country, and this has forced uh, the growth of the sector. So there's a report that showed that uh, 25 hotels added about 3,700 rooms. So this shows the, in, indicates the robust growth in the hospitality sector. We can go back up to the slide on the e-commerce, uh, Richard, yeah. So Kenya's online delivery service has grown rapidly. Uh, it's not hard to see why with the more people in the cities and the rise of the middle class, there's a demand for conveniency. Um, this is pushing the growth. So we have Uber Eats, we have, um, we have Copia, we have uh, Glovo, which is a Spanish company. Uber Eats is, of course, an American company. And they've become household names in, uh, in Kenya. They've, they've made it easy for consumers to get groceries meals and everyday essentials delivered right to their store. So um, um, Copia and um, Glovo are equivalent of what you have in the West as Amazon. So this has really growth has grown in the region. Also what's interesting is how retailers are catching on. They are partnering with these delivery platforms to tap into the growing pool of online shoppers. So we're getting an increase of online shopping, uh, especially driven by the young population, young demographic 
who are more tech savvy. Um, young people are seeing ads on Instagram, ads on TikTok, and they're going to these platforms to purchase pro products and also compare prices. So uh, for, for us, we see it's a win-win. Consumers get convenience and the retail expands their reach. Yeah. Um, you can go to the other slide. Okay, That's just it. to mention one thing, one other thing. Uh, this has grown ever since the COVID-19 pandemic. As people who are stuck home, they quickly turned on to online shopping for their needs. And even after lockdown eased, many have stuck to this habit. So this sector is only going to continue growing from here on end. Um, on Islam, uh, on this slide on Islam, there's a growing uh, population of um, Muslims. It's important to know. And with this demographic comes their cultural nuances. The, some of the products are, have to be halal. And they, we find that most of these people uh, in this sector the subsector uh, shop as a block. So those are some of the percentages you see in Kenya. We're at 11 percent. Tanzania is la slightly larger. Uh, Somalia is a predominantly Muslim nation with 99 percent. Yeah. Go to the next so, one, Richard. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go, so, go ahead. Um, okay. So thanks a lot, Charles. So what what we can establish there is that the the, the way that America does business is now a functional part of what is going on in East Africa. And it is just starting. If you saw some of those slides, a lot of this has been happening even just post-COVID. The last three years, especially maybe the last five years, we're seeing uh, Kenya really starting to embrace a lot of these um, global best practices, uh, turning far more toward um, retail shopping in terms of uh, not um, not being tied to the the local uh, fresh markets, but more toward uh, shopping in grocery stores and shopping malls, just as we are in the United States, the growth of the food services sector, the growth of online delivery. So all of these things are established already. And they're all at early stage, meaning that there's a lot of potential across the rest of East Africa as these concepts grow. But Nairobi has already accepted these areas and Nairobi is a, a leading market for adoption for a lot of these things. Um, and just to support what is happening there, we have an increase in cold storage, cold chain logistics, that is uh, part of the the strength of the Kenyan economy, but we can also see that there is an improvement generally in terms of electrical uh, uh, coverage for for homes here, which is what this um, uh, what this graph indicates. But tying this into the ability for uh, for businesses to take use of uh, cold chain. Uh, storage, warehousing, and getting things to the retailers. Uh, things are very uh, robust in Kenya, and they're developing in other areas. You can see that Rwanda has a 61% uh, share. So getting into these countries now with American exports that do require uh, cold storage is something that you will have to investigate, but typically you will find something positive to to look at and so we have um and uh, a developing market which is enabling the export of uh company products right into that um into that region so just generally charles already touched on where english is spoken uh, you can see the map in red here and what is interesting is that Young people across Africa are quickly taking up the English language as a uh, as a key to being tied to uh, the international uh, economy, a key to uh, international culture, a key to international business. And so, so we've seen English becoming very predominant. And where you see uh, French or Portuguese spoken, uh, also Arabic, there are 
large numbers of young people that can speak English fluently. Charles, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, just a comment. I know it shows that some of these places speak Arabic, but for example, in in Eritrea, in the Horn of Africa, just north of East Africa, in Somalia, in Ethiopia, we do have English speaking. Uh, so English may be the second language, but uh, you could get around in communicating and trading. So in the highlighted in the red is that English is the official uh, language. But on the other areas, we find that, uh, especially because of how the borders are, we have a cross-border movement. Um, we do have uh, the English language used uh, in these areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we're seeing that a lot of countries are uh, bringing English as one of the official languages. We saw Rwanda flip over from being French to English speaking in the yeah. last uh, decade. Uh, we're seeing along with all of that, and it's being driven by young people. Uh, in fact, we've seen Togo and Gabon join the British Commonwealth of Countries. Uh, which is a nexus for business development in a lot of ways, um, and countries that are uh, former French colonies that had nothing to do with the British Empire, um, they they joined the Commonwealth because their young people wanted to be more part of the English-speaking world. And this is something that is happening right across Africa. So as an American company, uh, you're going to be able to communicate even in these countries that are already English speaking very easily and uh, more and more progressively in English wherever you go across Africa. So just about the uh, the youth culture, um, we have a very strong uh, uh, youth culture as, as we've indicated with the uh, with the demographics. With, an, with a population of below 19, but very, very savvy about online. And so they consider that, um, that, that online access is very important to their lifestyle, very important to their, uh, their understanding of how they work and function together in, a local, um, in their local milieu. But I will also tell you that I've seen studies where, that have compared American youth with African youth. And one thing that really, really makes a big difference is that African youth use their phones a lot to promote business, to create business, to uh, to do market research and all of that compared to American youth who use it almost uh, entirely for entertainment purposes. And, and this is a big difference in how uh, culture can, can use the same tool, but uh, make a difference in terms of um, how, how that tool is being used. The next yeah, thing is to, that, oh, go ahead. Just to mention one thing be, before that, you would also find that, uh, and Richard, you've seen this, that uh, a young person could have a business, but he wouldn't have a website, but he would have an Instagram or Facebook page. That's what he's using as a website, just to speak to mm -hmm. how the youth are using and uh, the technology different from what we see in the West. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. So we're also seeing the growth of digital economies across Africa. And right now, uh, Kenya is approaching 8% annually per year. By 2050, uh, the, the group that did this um, study estimates that the growth in um, the, the digital economy in Kenya will be 15%. Uh, Per year, so this is this is big. A Africa is changing very radically and very quickly towards opportunities that present uh, globally. And if you can, if you can guess that the value of the digital economy in Kenya alone will possibly be over fifty billion dollars in real dollars coming up in the next decades, that's something to to think about. Hopefully by 2050, I'll be retired by then. It won't be so important for me, but uh, maybe for Charles, who's a little bit younger, um, it, it's going to be an important aspect of his life. But uh, we're also looking at Rwanda, which is another country which is moving up. So these are these are important aspects of, of understanding how Africa is interacting with the rest of the world. And this is also a, a thought piece on how you can reach out to your markets 
when you're getting into Africa as well, because understanding the culture means understanding how to reach your markets. And when you're choosing distributors, it's important to understand how they're positioned digitally. Uh, just very quickly about the youth culture, Africa has in the past been perceived as a place where corruption is is um, a, a problem. But amongst the youth culture, there's a whole different take on that. And the young people really, really hate corruption. And so we're seeing this already happening. We're seeing that in Africa, there's the old way of doing business, the new way of doing business. And so this is something that we could present on and, and that we, we could do a whole day seminar on the differences in African business culture between the older establishment and the younger ones. But effectively, uh, the, the biggest concern for young people in Africa is effectively how to eliminate corruption. It is the biggest concern. And so we are... Um, we're in a good place if you're here to do good business. And this is an important aspect of understanding. The other thing is, is that uh, people in Africa generally perceive foreign business and foreigners as a very positive influence. And so if if you were to take a straw poll of Americans, you probably wouldn't kind of, you wouldn't even get these numbers, but uh, they perceive China, they perceive the United Kingdom at, at uh, 80%. America is 79%. Those are the three big economies which, which come out very highly. Uh, even Russia has a relatively high, uh, not, not as high as the United States, but uh, so foreigners that come in to create business have a very positive um, look to them. And Americans especially, uh, if th there have been a couple of studies done that have asked young Africans, if you were to travel to a, a country for the first time, where would you go to? And 80% of them said the United States. So America has a uh, kind of like a, a, a very strong affiliation in the minds of young Africans that is very positive. Um, maybe... Charles, could, could you comment on the perceptions of Americans in Kenya? Yeah, I, I think um, with the young people, what we see that um, American culture has a significant influence in Kenya. Uh, most of the shows that are watched here in Africa, in Kenya, particularly are uh, Western. For example, we do have Netflix. Um, shows we have what's trending in Kenya from Netflix. We have Amazon Prime. Um, recent as recent as this year, Elon Musk. Uh, I think Kenya is second or the third country in where he launched Starlink. So Starlink right now is sold at the retail shops. You could get it quite easily. Um, I think it's about two hundred dollars. And they have plans as low as ten to fifteen to ten to twenty dollars. So we are uh, in Kenya. We consume a lot of um, American products, both online and also in the retail space. Uh, several of the products from the West, uh, from the U.S., find their way to our shelves. Uh, for example, our very home, we do have we do enjoy Cheerios. Uh, which is an American brand. We have Hershey's also. That's big Mars sneakers. So we, in, in they, with the, especially with the young people, um, there's a quite big inf there's a quite big influence in the country in terms of the consumer goods we consume, and also online some of the shows and some of the uh, podcasts we follow, and that has a direct influence. Uh, mm -hmm. to the Ken Kenyan culture. And importantly, uh, what are some of the political directions that Kenya has relating to the United States? Um, politically, um, Related politically, to the free trade I, agreement, yeah. <laughs> politically, I don't know. Uh, I, are you talking specifically about uh, what's happening in the U.S. and how we the receive... Free the free trade oh. agreement that's coming oh, up. Oh, the oh the free trade agreement. Ah, okay. Yeah. 
Um, I don't have any insight right now to that. Yeah, still in discussions right now. We don't have uh, we don't have any information yet right now on that. Right. So eventually, th there's negotiations going on, and Kenya has been um, selected as as the the big um, next step into uh, Africa for the United States. Africa is uh, being courted by the United States. Let's see how this continues uh, after the coming elections. But um, we're looking at a time when the United States is uh, is looking at countries like Kenya, Tanzania, um, Botswana is already a good friend. Morocco has a free trade agreement with the United States. Angola is becoming a very good friend to the United States. So the United States has a lot of uh, very strong allies. Whether you're on one side of the political aisle or not uh, makes no difference. Uh, these uh, countries are um, consider themselves relatively close to the United States in, in preference to uh, other powers in the world. And this is going to affect their, uh, their business dynamics. So if we look at the summary of the uh, of the market. W really, East Africa has fast economic growth. Uh, it's converging with U.S. brands and tastes, as we've discovered through discussing the retail markets, the uh, food service markets, and the online delivery markets, and, and how food is being brought in. Uh, there's a big youth emphasis, and uh, the demographic is only going to continue to grow. And so, these countries will remain young for a long time uh, to come, and the business culture is being driven by uh, by things that are very positive relative to how Americans like to do business, which is honest business based on trust and uh, long-term business relationships. So keep in mind that when you're coming in to do business, that uh, the, the youth culture and uh, e even the older culture very traditionally based, very family based, uh, faith community based, but um, looking at doing uh, good international business with good people. That's really the important thing. It's important that you you do filter your leads and understand how to get into the market. That's why we're there on behalf of Wusato. We're there to help you find the uh, the kinds of business partners that you want to be in alliance with for decades to come. Uh, the other thing is keep in mind that these markets are very digitally savvy and there's a lot of creativity. So coming in to partner with these markets is very important. Africa is developing into the largest common market in the world. So keep that in mind. And if you're coming in, uh, get an English Swahili phrase book and understand some of the key uh, Swahili phrases. So you can say greetings and uh, thank yous as you get into the market. So this is a market with over 400 million people. It's launched, it's ready to uh, to accept uh, new players. It is established already, as we've discussed, it's um, becoming a place where Americans are becoming more and more and more involved. And it's a very, very friendly market to the United States where you can come in, you can speak English, common law is the basis of doing things meaning your contracts are understandable. You understand generally how the courts can work. Um, and the way people conduct themselves in business is very similar to the United States. Uh, so there's a lot of abilities to, to come in and make this one of your uh, important markets in your business as your uh, company develops its sales globally. And then as just as an add on in this presentation, which will be available through Wusata later, we do have country slides which have some of the key statistics for each of the region regional countries we spoke about and um, we'll be able to communicate with each of you online or however you prefer afterward. So um, maybe uh, Hayden, do you want to moderate any of the questions that we've got? Yeah, absolutely. So we had, uh, oh, hi, Abigail. Um, we had one from Abigail. She says, do you have any information on how the duties on alcohol will change with the Kenya FTA? Uh, Charles, I'll leave that to you, but I think that 
at, at present we don't know, but they will likely be coming down. Yeah, yeah, we don't don't have the figures right now. Yeah, but I think with the new discussions going on, they should be coming down. Right now, most goods are at about twenty five percent, twenty five about around twenty five percent. But I can get the exact figures. Also, I can see Abigail has asked about Tanzania, and Nigeria. We'll have to get those figures to you. Yeah, we don't have top. We don't have them top of mind. Oh, let's see here. What is the most commonly accepted payment terms in the region? Yeah, so for for the first time, for the first time when products are being shipped into the region for the first time, most of the companies expect full payment uh, for the products. Some of the companies can work with the LLCs, uh, but it's dependent on the agreement between the importer and the exporter from the US, and you would make the arrangement on how you'll do that uh, payment. If, if, if you can work through a bank guarantee, uh, for example, with the US um, uh, Import-Export Bank, then you should be able to, uh, to, to get something that will be helpful to you. It does cost a, a percent or two on the value, but that will guarantee that you will not lose any of your uh, of the value. And as Charles indicated, typically the first or uh, few uh, transactions would be cash based and you would get payment in advance. And this is important to understand. You know, we we want to make sure that nobody uh, in this like, small group of friends here that we're developing uh, through Wusata does lose anything on a transaction. And uh, if there are anything that, uh, any issues, we, we'd we like to uh, possibly be part of any conversations that you would have. So, um, okay, so thanks, uh, Bauman, for that. Does anybody and else we have are... any questions? Sorry, Richard. No, go ahead. Nope, go ahead. No, I was just going to say we're looking forward to uh, working with Bomb and Fine Foods in the in the future. So thank you so much for that question. Uh, let's see here. In December, there are three different Rusada market research meetings from three different areas in Africa. Is there a need to do all three? Um, are you? Uh, I'm not sure if Charles, uh, which country, which company Charles is from. Um, there, each of the three are conducting, uh, well, we're, we're doing a project with five regions. And if your company is overlapping regions, then I would say, yes, it's important because you're going to be dealing with people in different regions. So consider that each region is geographically as big as the continental USA and has a population bigger. We, we do have a lot of differentiation in each of the markets and we want to make sure that you are um, uh, you, you're you're together what's what's happening and that you're in contact with the trade advisors who are working in that region specifically so they have an a clean uh, channel of communication with you. So uh, I'm not sure which company you're with, but I think it's um, important to uh, if you've been invited to a meeting to discuss personally with the trade advisory staff, then I think it's um, important. Um, Charles, do you have any insights on that? Beef jerky. Um, sorry, I'm reading the, the questions here. Are there any important? Sorry, are you asking me to go ahead in the next question? Uh, relating you to Charles, off. relating to Charles Har Howard, um, oh, okay. Responses, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So uh, I think what you said, Richard, I, I'll echo what you said. If uh, countries are overlapping, I don't think there'd be need. But what we're doing with the Wusata project, I don't know if he's talking about the same pro project we're doing, is uh, we are looking at different countries in the whole of Africa. So we could have uh, market research done in Morocco, market research done in Egypt, and market research done in South Africa. These are uh, three distinct uh, uh, three distinct countries with their different nuances. 
uh, different uh, prices, different importers. So it, it would be important to have uh, that data from these different regions. So if you're looking to bring your products into Africa, yeah, those are three distinct uh, markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would um, like to add that we are we are doing a uh, a virtual trade mission next year, 2025. Uh, for Wusata based companies, and we're looking forward to further work under uh, some new funding that's happening with the US federal government, and that's going to be channeled through Wusata. So we're uh, looking for a lot of opportunities for American exporters to come through into the African market, which has been specifically uh, strategically targeted by uh, the, the US federal government and state governments for uh, entry purposes. So we're here on the ground across Africa. You remember the map. We've got people everywhere across Africa to help you in all of these key markets. So we're looking forward to working with you. Um, I think we've got about a minute and a half left. Uh, Hayden, do you want to uh, have any final words? Uh, yeah, so I'll just kind of wrap up. I We will have this recording. Um, We'll send out a, you know, a, a thank you for attending as well as our future events that we have coming up for our webinars. Um, I will follow up with everybody here in the chat or anybody who wasn't able to make it. Um, but we will also have this recording put up and through our website as well as our YouTube page um, for anybody that would like to go back and reference some of that, you know, information that you guys had specifically on countries or just revisit your, you know, your presentation. It was very well done. So thank mm -hmm. you again. And kind of all I have for everybody. So.